A today. Uh, we fin finished up chapter nine yesterday talking about um, market stuff and everything. Today we'll, uh, and the changing concepts in the United States over the economy and um, Western population a little bit. Today we're going to talk about the vigorous political changes and democratic changes that will occur on the age of Jackson. Um, so, focus questions for today will center around what were the social bases for the flourishing democracy of the early mid-19th century? What efforts strengthened or hindered economic integration of the nation? What were the major areas of conflict between nationalism and sectionalism? Uh, in what ways did Andrew Jackson embody the contradictions of democratic nationalism? How did the bank influence, uh, the bank war influence the economy and party um, competition? So introduction, Jackson's uh, inauguration changed things in the country. It was large and showed politics had changed, and it was very much for the people, by the people, and with the people. Jackson represented a self-made man and the man who fitted westward expansion, opportunities, democratic expansion, slavery's expansion, and the market revolution. In fact, one thing the unique about Andrew Jackson and his inauguration, the reason we talked about his inauguration being big and people involved, he essentially threw a kager on the White House lawn and invited many, many people. He was not a rich man. He came from more of a common background, though he became well established. Uh, but by most standards, he was not an elitist. So as we get into this democracy in America, Jackson is a is a break from what had been established in the country leading up. The triumph of democracy, prosperity in, in democracy. Not one state after the original thirteen made a proper requirement to vote. Ownership of oneself was all that was needed, and thus you will have the dramatic shift from what the even the original 13 colonies required, and then the, the old former uh, mother country of England. You have a little war called the Door War. The lone exception to trend was Rhode Island, which required voters to own land, and $134 or rent, at least $7 per year. Uh, so they will have a little bit of the land requirement, but not really much. In 1841, People's Convention drafted a new constitution, inaugurated Thomas Door, a prominent Rhode Island law, as governor. In French, all and adult white men. John Tyler dispatched federal troops and the movement collapsed. Uh, but the whole point of this little thing was a little bit, though the door war was very short-lived, it does show you the idea to expand people's rights uh, and to be more democratic in nature across the board. Tocqueville on democracy. We talked about Tocqueville, a little bit of French historian. By 1840, more than 90% of adult white male were eligible to vote. Radical compared to the rest of the world. Tocqueville came to study uh, prisons, but instead focused on democracy. He came to look at American prisons, but instead he looked at more of our democracy and our republic and how we functioned. He realized by this time it was more than a voting or set of political institutions. It was habit of heart, individual initiative, belief in equality, and an active public sphere. Or sphere. He's going to recognize those, those major elements of a democracy and a republic. Now, triumph of democracy too. The information revelation. Now, we're not, it's not the information revelation we have of the 90s or the 2000s in which, you know, the rise of the internet and all that. But you have the rise of newspapers and literacy and reduced cost allowed for expansion. People able to understand and hear news more, books more. Uh, so it's, it's, it's as much a printing thing as anything. Now, there's going to be limits of democracy. Age of Jackson, it was believed the people ruled, those who opposed hid their heads. Uh, gender and racial differences were not solved too much later. White men were viewed as superior in all aspects. So this democratic expansion is not going to be all inclusive. A racial democracy, blacks were either not portrayed in books, plays, or depicted as stupid and superstitious and a monkey-like in many cases. Several states had allowed free blacks to vote. This was all res rescinded though going into the 19th century. Race instead of class became the boundary in America. I don't need to think go crazy into that, but it's clear that race was the border and not um, uh, financial. Though that was part of it, um, race was the bigger player. Nationalism and discontents. The American system, the War of 1812, it showed many weaknesses in America. Madison put forward the government promoted economic development plan after the war. A new national bank, 20-year charter, will be created. A tariff on imported manufacturing goods to protect American industry as well bring in some revenue. Federal financing of improved roads and canals. Madison vetoed it because it was not in the Constitution. But you're going to see there's going to be a, 
um, the American system of what we would think of the North and the South to develop uh, and then dependence on American goods will finally come into fruition. Banks and monies, private corporation uh, that oversaw the nation's money there to there to ensure paper money was regulated and that the banks didn't overproduce uh, the species, gold and silver they had. Uh, and then the Bannock of 1819, overproduction of paper money and loans to Western farmers and settlers. They did not control it, obviously, very effectively. Uh, is going to create um, some panic. Demand in Europe and decline of the banks were not asking for payments. This busted the bubble of these expanded banks. Now many became uh, become distrusting the banks and the national bank, especially after this bust and some closure and people losing some money. Ultimately, though, the McCall versus Maryland, they affirmed the bank was legal and necessary proper with the necessary and proper clause. And so what you're seeing here um, during this nationalism and discontent, discontents is though as we become more independent than from Europe, uh, our economic system is going to always be in question. Oh, and it's going to center around the bank. And you can see here, uh, this private corporation overseeing the money, people did not trust it. And you need, honestly, you think about uh, even in the modern world, Americans tend not to trust the banks because you've heard those old wives' tales or those tales of the grandpa, grandma burying their money in the backyard in a tin can. Uh, so there is a deep distrust for banks going back many, many generations. Missouri controversy. This one is dear to us in Missouri because it is very pronounced and very well, includes us pretty heavily. The era of good feelings, James Monroe, time and age of one party and everything was going smooth, but Missouri's request for state had caused many problems uh, in this era of good feelings. Jesse Thomas of Illinois is going to propose a compromise uh, because Missouri ultimately wanted to come in as a slave state and that would have disrupted the balance that had been created between slave and free states. So it's going to be proposed, drafting, Missouri drafted a constitution that did not prohibit slavery. Maine will be brought into the discussion. They will uh, become in with a constitution that forbids slavery, and then snow slavery in the rest of Louisiana Purchase or north of Missouri southern border. This showed problems of slavery's expansion west, and that was going to be an issue going forward. Ultimately, though, the Missouri Compromise brought uh, peace to allow those two states to come forward. Jefferson stated, "It's a fi life is a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered all at once the kneel of the Union." or the knell of the union, meaning slavery was going to be a problem. This was a piecemeal. They knew this was not going to be a permanent solution. This was to get by. Though Missouri enters in 1821 as the 24th state, and Maine will be amended as well, this shows the path west is not going to be easy. Nation, section, and party. The United States and Latin America, wars of independence. Uh, between 1810 and 1822, Spain's Latin American colonies rose up in rebellion and established their own independent nations. Monroe administration became the first government to extend diplomatic recognition. And we're going to also get what's called the Monroe Doctrine in the next part, which is three principles. The United States would oppose any further effort of colonization by Europe and the Americas. The United States would abstain from invasion in the European wars as a result. And Monroe warned of European powers not to interfere with these newly independent states. Basically, you stay in Europe, we'll stay in the Americas. And that will be the predominant thought for nearly 100 years in the United States, with only us really coming into conflict, coming into World War I. The election of 1824, growing sense of nationalism, but sectionalism ruled domestic politics. Andrew Jackson's popularity rested on his war hero status and his policy, not necessarily his policies. Four candidates, none got majority vote, though Jackson was well held in the popular votes, meaning none of them were able to capture the states and the electoral votes enough to win. So this went to the House of Representatives when a clear winner is not in occur. Henry Kay gave his support to John Quincy Adams. Jackson labeled it as a corrupt bargain. Clay became Adams Secretary of State. Thus, you can see where Jackson could say this is a corrupt bargain. You know, the Speaker of the House becomes now, or Clay, who was a congressman, ushered this deal, is now given a very prominent job. You can see how he could label it corrupt. Obviously, and also John Quincy was the son of John Adams, you know, political uh, politics connections there. So you can see where uh, Jackson, an outsider, viewed this as a corrupt event. Nation section in party two. Now the nationalism of John Quincy Adams. Enjoyed one of the most distinguished pre-presidential uh, careers of any. 
He was an ardent expandist, expansionist, meaning moving west, manifest destiny, if you won't call it. Clear vision of national greatness uh, and understood a broad sense of things. Far more expansive federal government, national university, astronomy, observatory, and naval academy. Spent more on internal improvements than those of his five predecessors combined and enacted a steep increase in tariff rates in 1828. Basically, John Adams was very, John Quincy Adams was very well rounded, most because of his upbringing, but understood a great deal of many things. Now, not saying he was a great president, I'm not going to go there, but Jackson, obviously four years later, are going to organize very ardently. Martin Van Buren and the Democratic Party, nation section of Party 3. Jackson supporters began to organize for 1828. Adam was on an intellectual and an old was an intellectual and an old system politician. Van Buren helped organize the new era uh, and rose to prominence within the Democratic Party and helped usher in a new era. Van Buren represented the new political era. Son of a tavern keeper, had no grand vision and or high intellect. He was a commoner, a self-made man. He did realize the National Party system could do many things, and thus it is at this point that you see the ushering in of the National Convention to nominate a candidate. And that is where we get through this whole primary system. We end with the conventions that will be right before the elections next year. And they are very prominent. And it all starts here. The election of 1828, Van Buren created a large apparatus at the local, state, and national level for the Democratic Party. The 1828 election campaign was scrupulous and very difficult. Uh, but what you're going to see Van Buren organize at the behalf of Jackson is basically going to door to door, getting people behind Jackson and get him out to vote. Jackson supporters praised his frontier manualist, ridiculed Adams' intellectual attainments or limitations, meaning he's just a stuffy old suit, and attacked Jackson's wife, Rachel, married before her divorce was final, and we could go hours into that discussion. But essentially, Jackson and his wife, Rachel, had been married maybe before she was officially divorced, mostly because she had been abandoned by her husband for a year or more. Uh, but in the end, Jackson will win a resounding vi victory, though it did cost him his wife's life, and that will make him bitter uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, his wife did die from ailments, uh, partly because she slipped into depression and her health declined because of the attacks. His election was the first to be uh, to demonstrate how the Advent Universal White Male Voting Organized could act in a block. So he ushers in a new heir, what we often call the Age of Jackson. And this is the Age of Jackson 1. The party system had become a spectacle, a form of mass entertainment. Newspapers became vital to get the party platform out. And it's really not, though, no different than this day. And you think about how the, uh, the Republicans and Democrats, even the Libertarians or Independents, often get their message out. Jackson introduced the principle of rotation in office called spoil system by opponents. Basically, you reward your, uh, your, your supporters with jobs. Happens to this day. Gave supporters jobs to supporters. Jackson's kitchen cabinet was often sometimes uh, a group of informal people that he'd come into the White House that he'd get advice from. Uh, mostly newspaper editors at that time, but it's kind of a unique way you bring outsiders in and let, just basically get the word of the people. Democrats and the Whigs, Jackson's problem came from the uh, market revolution. The West and the South are going to have way different economies and way different of doing things. Uh, he was more hands-off approach. The wide gap between the rich and others got bigger. And the sectional problems between the North, South, and West are going to exist, most between the North and the South. He ain't going to do anything to, to solve it. Now, the Whigs will be the party that was basically the remnants of the Federalists will emerge. They united in the, uh, the, the, or the American system, um, Northeast, the merchants, businessmen. They're going to pass the protective tariffs, the National Bank, and aid to internal improvements. Uh, they want to basically defeat Jackson and all his maneuvers. So basically, you have two parties at this point, the Democrats and then the Whigs. Okay, we're going to stop there for today, and we'll forget into the age of Jackson 2 tomorrow. You see that Jackson, basically the biggest thing beside, with Jackson is, as he comes into office, there's the air of good feeling, yes, but then you're going to have the, the elections of 1824 in which, you know, the people are going to be denied their initial president. Because though he was leading the popular vote, Electoral College and all that, went to the House of Representatives, you're going to see now, as Jackson is elected, he's going to make it more democratic uh, for people to elect their candidates. But at the same token, Jackson also represented the first time for an outsider, someone who was not an elitist and a, a member of the founders and all that, to become president. And so 
that in itself would be pretty cool. Hey, this president's changing things. But as we'll find out tomorrow, though Jackson is a man of the people, he's going to make some critical decisions and arguably makes him one of the worst presidents in the history of the United States. And we'll get to that more to later. Bye.